And now it is my honor to introduce to you my husband, the President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. We've come to your nation to deliver a very important message. America loves Poland, and America loves the Polish people. Thank you. On behalf of all Americans, let me also thank the entire Polish people for the generosity you have shown in welcoming our soldiers to your country. These soldiers are not only brave defenders of freedom, but also symbols of America's commitment to your security and your place in a strong and democratic Europe. And I am thrilled that it could be right here at this magnificent, beautiful piece of land. It is beautiful. Poland is the geographic heart of Europe. But more importantly, in the Polish people, we see the soul of Europe. Your nation is great because your spirit is great, and your spirit is strong. For two centuries, Poland suffered constant and brutal attacks. But while Poland could be invaded and occupied, and its borders even erased from the map, it could never be erased from history or from your hearts. You are the proud nation of Copernicus, Chopin, St. John Paul II, Poland is a land of great heroes. And you are a people who know the true value of what you defend. The story of Poland is the story of a people who have never lost hope, who have never been broken, and who have never, ever forgotten who they are. Under a double occupation, the Polish people endured evils beyond description. The Katyn Forest Massacre, the occupations, the Holocaust, the Warsaw Ghetto, and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the destruction of this beautiful capital city, and the deaths of nearly one in five Polish people. Amid that hell on earth, the citizens of Poland rose up to defend their homeland. I am deeply honored to be joined on stage today by veterans and heroes of the Warsaw Uprising. We salute your noble sacrifice, and we pledge to always remember your fight for Poland and for freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Your oppressors tried to break you, but Poland could not be broken. And when the day came on June 2nd, 1979, and one million Poles gathered around Victory Square for their very first mass with their Polish Pope, that day, every communist in Warsaw must have known that their oppressive system would soon come crashing down. They must have known it at the exact moment during Pope John Paul II's sermon, when a million Polish men, women, and children suddenly raised their voices in a single prayer. A million Polish people did not ask for wealth. They did not ask for privilege. Instead, one million Poles sang three simple words, we want God. A strong Poland is a blessing to the nations of Europe, and they know that. A strong Europe is a blessing to the West and to the world. The United States has demonstrated not merely with words, but with its actions that we stand firmly behind Article 5, a mutual defense commitment.
That is why we applaud Poland for its decision to move forward this week on acquiring from the United States the battle-tested Patriot air and missile defense system, the best anywhere in the world. That is also why we salute the Polish people for being one of the NATO countries that has actually achieved the benchmark for investment in our common defense. Thank you. Thank you, Poland. I must tell you, the example you set is truly magnificent, and we applaud Poland. Thank you. We can have the largest economies and the most lethal weapons anywhere on Earth. But if we do not have strong families and strong values, then we will be weak, and we will not survive. If anyone forgets the critical importance of these things, let them come to one country that never has. Let them come to Poland. Our own fight for the West does not begin on the battlefield. It begins with our minds, our wills, and our souls. Today, the ties that unite our civilization are no less vital and demand no less defense than that bare shred of land on which the hope of Poland once totally rested. Our freedom, our civilization, and our survival depend on these bonds of history, culture, and memory. And today as ever, Poland is in our heart, and its people are in that fight. Just as Poland could not be broken, I declare today for the world to hear that the West will never, ever be broken. Our values will prevail. Our people will thrive. And our civilization will triumph. Thank you. God bless you. God bless the Polish people. God bless our allies. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you very much. Americans must know that we are putting the American people first again on trade. So true. On trade, on immigration, on foreign policy, the jobs, incomes, and security of the American worker will always be my first priority. No country has ever prospered that failed to put its own interests first. Both our friends and our enemies put their countries above ours. And we, while being fair to them, must start doing the same. We will no longer surrender this country or its people to the false song of globalism. The nation state remains the true foundation for happiness and harmony. I am skeptical of international unions that tie us up and bring America down and will never enter. And under my administration, we will never enter America into any agreement that reduces our ability to control our own affairs. NAFTA, as an example, has been a total disaster for the United States and has emptied our states, literally emptied our states, of our manufacturing and our jobs. And I've just gotten to see it. I've toured Pennsylvania. I've toured New York. I've toured so many of the states. They have been cleaned out. Their manufacturing is gone. Never again, only the ver and I have to say this strongly, never again, only the reverse will happen. We will keep our jobs and bring in new ones. There will be consequences for the companies that leave the United States only to exploit it later. They fire the people. They take advantage of the United States. There will be consequences for those companies. Never again. Under a Trump administration, no American citizen will ever again feel that their needs come second to the citizens of a foreign country. Applause 
I will view as president the world through the clear lens of American interests. I will be America's greatest defender and most loyal champion. We will not apologize for becoming successful again, but will instead embrace the unique heritage that makes us who we are. A globalist is a person that wants the globe to do well, frankly, not caring about our country so much. And you know what? We can't have that. You know, they have a word. It sort of became old-fashioned. It's called a nationalist. And I say, really, we're not supposed to use that word. You know what I am? I'm a nationalist, okay? I'm a nationalist. Nationalist. Nothing else. Use that word. Use that word. Did you hear that? Use that word. He said it a second time to make sure that he got it on mic. But why is he telling us to use that word? Because the Trump movement is a broad coalition of anti-establishment conservatives. And the one thing that unites us all is nationalism over globalism. And that's why he's pushing it going into the midterms. Now, you may think that being the president of a country and being a nationalist go hand in hand. But previous presidents have used the term patriot instead of nationalist. Why? Well, according to Merriam-Webster, the difference is that nationalism includes exalting one's nation above all others and placing primary emphasis on the promotion of its culture and interest as opposed to those of other nations or supranational groups. This exclusionary aspect is not shared by patriotism. Now, we all know the response from the opposition will be to pull their favorite card and cry, RACISM! Well here, he shows how to handle that NPC level response. Could you, could you, just, uh, could you, just, uh, could you settle some of the confusion over your comments about what you mean when you say you're a nationalist? What does that mean? I love our country, and our country has taken set, second fiddle. If you look at the trade deals, and nobody knows it better than me, I'm knocking out some of the worst deals I've ever seen where we're giving all of our wealth, all of our money to other countries, and then they don't treat us properly. Where we're protecting other rich countries, very, very rich countries, including, by the way, a country that happens to be very much in the news, Saudi Arabia, immensely wealthy, and we're taking care of their military for a fraction of the cost, not fair to us. Other countries also, immensely wealthy countries, and we have to get reimbursed for that. We should not be the world's police keeper and not get reimbursed. And by the way, when I bring up to the heads of countries like Japan, Prime Minister Abe, a friend of mine, I bring it up, he looks at me, and he goes, I understand. They understand it. Nobody's ever asked them. I said, have you ever asked? I said, have you ever been asked, like, you have to be, like, help out? Nobody's ever asked. So that's a pretty unfair thing. Well, I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you. Wait, 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 wait. I'm going to get back to you. If I may ask, can I ask my follow-up? No, not now. I'll get back to you, I said. All right. I can't take the whole thing. You have a lot of other very fine well, reports. Go ahead, yes. Mr. Urban, no, I'm, I'm behind you, please. Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, yes, go ahead. Mr. President, just to follow up on your comments about being a nationalist, there is a concern that you are sending coded language or a dog whistle to some Americans out there that what you really mean is that you're a white nationalist. I've never even heard that. I cannot imagine that. You mean, I say, I'm a nationalist. No, I never heard that theory about being a nationalist. I've heard them all. But I'm somebody that loves our country. When I say a nationalist, I don't like it when Germany's paying 1% of GDP for NATO, and we're paying 4.3%. I don't like that. That's not fair. I don't like it when, as an example, we're protecting uh, Europe. And we're paying for almost the entire cost of NATO. We're paying for a very, very substantial portion, far greater than what it should be. Uh, we have great respect for those countries. But on top of that, I don't like it when they put up barriers to our farmers, where our farmers cannot sell into Europe. They have trade barriers that make it, you guys know it better than anybody. They have trade barriers that are as severe as China's trade barriers, which will be coming down. They want to make a deal very badly. They'll be coming down. 
But I am very proud of our country. We cannot continue to allow what's happened to our country to continue to happen. We can't let it happen. So I'm proud. I'm proud of our country. And I am a nationalist. It's a word that hasn't been used too much. Some people use it. But I'm very proud. I think it should be brought back. I'm somebody that wants to help other countries of the world. But I also have to take care. We have to take care of our country. We cannot continue to allow ourselves to be duped on military and also duped on trade. With the European Union, as an example, last year on trade, we lost $151 billion. On top of that, we lost hundreds of billions of dollars on protection. So we protect and we get killed. We, we do the trading and they get killed. Can't do it. I want it to be fair. So I want them to open their borders. I want them to make it fair for our farmers, our, our companies, our medical companies. They sell medical equipment. They just put restrictions on a year and a half ago where the medical equipment can't get into Europe, even though it's better than what they have. So they have to treat us well. All I want our country is to be treated well, to be treated with respect. For many years, other countries that are allies of ours, so-called allies, they have not treated our country fairly. So in that sense, I am absolutely a nationalist, and I'm proud of it.